Welcome to the Exam Room Podcast, brought to you by the Physicians Committee. Hi, I'm the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll, joined today by the happy bariatric doctor from Houston Methodist, Dr. Garth Davis. Man, good to see you. It's good to see you, Chuck. Thanks for having me on. It's the first time in a while, and I feel like, honestly, we should have been doing so many shows together. There's just so much that we should be talking about, because when it comes to obesity and being overweight, I mean, this is a complicated topic, Garth. It's a really complicated topic. I've spent 22 years studying it, and I don't have the answer yet. I always thought like I would come up with an answer and that answer would fix everything. And 22 years in, I don't feel like I've got an answer at all. So do you find like the, the answer though, is a little bit different for every patient because the individuals themselves are very different. Oh yeah. I mean, I've got patients where we talk lifestyle, they understand lifestyle. They're totally successful. Hallelujah. I got patients where I could talk lifestyle till I'm blue in the face and nothing happens. I give a shot of a medication to one patient. Oh my God, this is the greatest thing ever to another patient. I don't feel it. Mm. Weight loss surgery to one patient. This is great to another. No. And you know, there's a big difference between someone who's 220 pounds and someone who's 450 pounds. It's a huge wide difference. There's a difference between men and women. There's a difference in different ages. There's so many different things. Some people have, you know, a true genetic component to this. There's other people that have had childhood traumas that are driving it. Mm. They're, they're, the, the etiology, the pathophysiology, it's all very complex and very different amongst people. So I don't know that we will have one answer for this problem. And I've always found that one size doesn't fit all. You know, people ask me, what did, what did you do? Well, you had the surgery and people focus on that one thing. It's like, yeah. But then, you know, I took from this piece and I took from that piece and that diet and something this person said, and I put them all together in my own way to create what works for me, essentially the Chuck diet, right? But the Chuck diet isn't going to work for Diane. It may not work for Suzanne. It may not work for Mike. It's finding what works for you based off of some universal principles. Right. I was going to say, there's got to be some universal principle. Right. Yeah. Right. So I I do think the Chuck diet probably would work for most people. They just wouldn't think to do the Chuck diet. Right. (laughs) Um, But it probably would work. It it just, individuals differ it's not so much that our physiology differs necessarily, but our tolerance for different things differ. And just get people to do these different things is really difficult. So let's go back to you were talking about this genetic component. I mm. would imagine that the majority of your patients, just hazarding a guess here, when they come in, they come from a family of people who are struggling with their weight. And I'm sure they feel like my mom was overweight, my dad was overweight, my grandfather, my, my brothers, my sisters, all overweight. Therefore, I too am overweight. Do they have any idea of the amount of control that they actually have despite whatever genetic connection they may have with obesity? I don't think so because I don't think they've ever felt in control. Most of them have been overweight their entire life. Some of them went to, you know, quote unquote, fat camps when they were kids. <laughs> They've done diet after diet and never been successful, so they don't feel like they're under control, which is why they're seeing someone to cut them open and you know do a big surgery on them, or even if they're seeing me from a medical uh, standpoint to get medicines. You know, it's not something that you that's not your first decision mm-hmm. when you're overweight. So most of my patients don't feel in control, and they've seen their their parents fail. And a lot of people say, well, it's not genetic; it's just that their parents eat the same diet they do or have the same lifestyle. Certainly you could look at statistics and certain zip codes have higher obesity rates. And so you wouldn't think zip codes to have a genetic correlation, but there's definitely a genetic component. They did these really amazing studies uh, in Holland on twins. Twins are a great study, right? So you could look at monozygotic twins or dizygotic twins. So like identical twins or fraternal twins. And what you'll see is that with identical twins, they carry the same weight really, even if they were split up at birth and grew up in different environments, uh, whereas fraternal twins could have completely different weights, even in the same environment. And so the genetic researchers in in the study felt that the most inheritable gene we have is height and weight. Those two 
are, are very well correlated. And what are these genes coding for? Hunger. I mean, there's some people that are hungrier than other people. Metabolism. They're, you know, everybody's got a friend who can eat a, you know, donut and not gain any weight, and someone else has like one bite and, shh, you know, they're they're, they're getting those people. Weight. And you know who yeah, you are, you people. Know who you are. <laughs> uh, and so the the genes do code for different things when it comes to satiety, when it comes to metabolism. So let's say that you then have the identical twins. One's eating that healthier diet, the other one closer to the standard American diet, but both of them, you know, still struggling with Mm -hmm. their weight. So then what then could you do to get both of them moving in the right direction? If you have that strong of a genetic component, like what actually then gets them moving in a healthier direction so you can kind of reverse the disease that is obesity? Yeah, I mean... when I say they're both eating different and one's probably a good environment, you got to first label what's a good environment. I mean, <laughs> what's right. a good environment now in, in modern day is really not a good environment. You know, yeah. uh, me eating multiple times a day, really not moving that much. But, you know, you, you know how it is. Like people go to the I go to the gym. I'm fine. But they go 30 minutes, three days a week. And the rest of the days they're just sitting. Uh, oh, I eat a pretty healthy diet. I have eggs for breakfast. I, you know, have a sandwich with sandwich meat for lunch lunch and I've got chicken for dinner. Everybody thinks chicken's healthy, so they're eating chicken all day long. Meanwhile, the EPIC study in Europe, 500,000 people followed 12 years. Chicken was one of the number one uh, indicators of weight gain. Mm. And so a lot of what we think is healthy now, what is considered healthy even in studies, is probably not a healthy diet. I feel like doing some hot takes. Let's do a hot take. You What's a hot, a hot take? A hot take is yeah, let's do a hot there, take. there is, I mean, you know, you, you've been to a lot of conferences and you've spoken with a lot of people and there is a very divisive view when it comes to surgical interventions and weight loss drugs. And there's mm. very much the pro. Yes, it can be a tool. It can be a great jump start. There's the, also the camp that says it's everything. And then there are those who say absolutely positively, it is a barbaric thing to do. You should never do it. It will never work. It is absolutely the wrong thing to do. In your experience, and take the bias as a practicing physician, if you can, out of the equation, where do you weigh in on that? And is there a way, perhaps, for all of these things to work in conjunction with each other? Is well, there's that clearly, I mean, clearly, they're going to work conjunction with each other. So let's start with the, is surgery barbaric? Um, and I did the talk today at the meeting and I said, it's a little bit barbaric, right? I mean, I'm cutting people open and rerouting their intestines and taking out pieces of stomach. And, uh, I always think to myself, gosh, this seems dramatic. But then the question is, are my efforts worth it? Do my efforts actually lead to a longer, healthier life with better quality of life? And we've got Excellent studies now that show absolutely that's true. If you take a randomized study where one person goes into a strict lifestyle program and another person gets the weight loss surgery, the weight loss surgery almost always does better than the lifestyle Mm. program and does better on many different factors. Less diabetes, less heart disease, less cancer, um, longer life expectancy, and what I really like is the definite better quality of life. So Surgery is extreme. It's not for everybody, but it definitely has its role until we've got something that does better and nothing, even the new medications don't come close. But that doesn't mean that surgery should just be done and then you never see the patient again. Mm. That that surgery should be a tool so that the patient, the hard part for the patient is to adopt a healthy lifestyle because they are so hungry. Right. And what the surgery does is take away that hunger so that they could now make healthier choices and follow a healthier lifestyle. And so those two have to be done together. So let's, I'll walk you through my experience where after having surgery, there were mandatory support groups you had to attend every Wednesday afternoon. I'd clear extra time off of my work schedule to do this during lunch. And there was a dietitian in there with us. And there was typically a trainer in there with us. And the whole idea was That's nice. That's good. It, wait for it. Oh gosh. Uh, so, you know, in theory, it's everybody sharing what's been working for them, what doesn't work for them. And mind you, at the time that I'm going through this, I still didn't know anything about what it truly meant to eat healthy. Nobody had told me the idea of a plant-based diet that was still years away. But what I did know based off of my previous epiphany of being a food addict and really wanting to make sure that I was completely abstinent was the idea of moderation with these kinds of foods Mm, is not a good idea because moderation leads to disaster in my particular instance. And so there were people in this group who 
over time, like would bring out pieces of candy. Oh, and they would ask the dietitian, gosh. is this okay? Oh, the dietitian is like, yeah, you're going to be fine. Mm. Just make sure that you eat less. Moderate yourself. Mm. Well, they weren't pulling out just like a bite-sized snicker. It was a big bag of Swedish fish. I'm talking oh, like a gosh. family-sized bag yeah. of Swedish fish. So that started it. Yeah. The next week, is it okay to have soda every once and again if it's a diet soda? Sure enough, boom, out comes a one liter. Right diet sprite right right and so every and it's a week slope it is and every yeah. week somebody else was bringing some sort of what i call contraband in there i don't mean to be so you know yeah. dramatic about it but that's right. essentially what it was when you're dealing with a bunch of food addicts and the message that's being given to the patients was that this stuff is okay in moderation yeah. and i didn't know anything again about healthy eating but i knew yeah. that these were the people who would be back for that revision surgery that we were told about during the initial consultation yeah, no question yeah 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 I, there's always this debate over moderation versus extremes i kind of in some things i think there needs to be a line in the sand uh, I, sometimes it's easier to do something with a hundred percent than 99%. Right. Because you're trying to do it 99% and all of a sudden that 1% becomes like, when's my 1%? Is my 1% this morning? Or maybe you did it this morning and then the afternoon, well, okay, maybe that was half percent I'm going to add and next thing you know, you're sliding back in. There's also physiologic reasons why that's not a good idea because after a gastric bypass, you become extremely insulin sensitive. So you were insulin resistant. The surgery works really well making you insulin sensitive. Now, if you eat that Swedish fish or that candy, you're going to get a spike in blood sugar and a rapid drop in blood sugar. Mm -hmm. What does that rapid drop in blood sugar do? Makes you hungry. And not only does it make you hungry, it makes you hungry to get that blood sugar back up for more candy and more Swedish fish. So it's asking for a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, and so in certain situations with our patients, I do have foods where I say, you got to go cold turkey on these. The foods that I want them to go off, but we're doing shifts is more in the protein realm uh, because that I find really hard. And, you know, I just can't make everybody vegan uh, that I'll lose patients that way. Uh, <laughs> and people will go the opposite direction. But I do think we could flip the plate so that it's not all protein so that they are getting some fiber. You wouldn't believe how many patients are told just to eat protein, protein, protein. All they eat is protein. They get no fiber, they're constipated, they're having GI issues, and they're starting to gain weight again. The most constipated I've ever been in my life was post-op. Yeah. And dairy was shoved down our throat. Protein, Which protein, the protein. Yeah. Eat the baby bell cheese. Drink yeah. as much milk as you possibly can. Right. You know, have a slice of ham rolled up with, with the cheese. With the cheese. Yeah. Don't eat the bread. Heavens crazy. no. Yeah. Bread's, and if you do, make sure problem. it's white bread, right? So and, crazy. And it's just like, yeah, so crazy. I would go three, four days without going, and yeah. when I did, I mean, it it was literally you've heard it blanking bricks yeah i mean i was dropping bombs man dropping bombs. it sucked <laughs> it's terrible yeah i mean look it's amazing to me how this is i mean you've drawn this idea that we need to do all of the things together right we need to have the surgery and the diet and all that stuff it's amazing to me that i will go to our surgery meetings and spend a week and we're going through science and we're talking all day we're never talking about diet mm -mm. it's an obesity conference we're never talking about diet how did, that doesn't even compute to me. It doesn't. But in the hands of a surgeon, like when you're a hammer, all the world's a nail. And, and we talk, we'll, we'll give like some lip service to diet. Eat more protein. That's what the diet is. Eat, just eat more protein. But no one's actually doing studies to say, what should the diet be like after surgery? I'm, I'm working on a study on that right now. But the available studies that have been done don't show this amazing benefit to high protein. Mm -hmm. And we aren't seeing at least not in the malabs in the non malabsorption surgeries we're not seeing protein deficiency mm. we're seeing some other vitamin deficiencies not protein deficiency to that end i mean as we record this we we just had this conference i told the story of being prescribed a hamburger. Yeah, I can't believe that. Protein. That was crazy. Literally, I'm sitting as close to him as you are to me right mm. now, and he prescribed me a hamburger, and I will never forget that day. And That's I insane. walked out of there angry. Yeah. Again, years away from being plant based, but I was like, you have literally just put a rock of crack in the palm of an addict. Yeah, it's 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 totally bizarre to me because that's what got you there and he's going to give you that to get back it, it makes no sense I, I i get where they get this protein idea from but there have been some really large trials not in surgery patients uh but there was a huge trial that was going to be the trial that was going to tell whether protein 
helped with weight loss and it, it came back no it didn't really make a difference if you were on a high protein versus a low protein diet but this is stuck in their mind that protein is the way to go and i don't they never seem to ask themselves well, what are the healthiest people in the world what are the skinniest people in the world eating and it isn't high protein they're mm. eating actually relatively low protein mm. so they want you to be 25 30 percent protein but if you look at a blue zone population they're usually 10 to 12 percent protein and uh, but the, like I said, when I go to these meetings, we're studying new surgical techniques and things like that. We're not studying which diet works best with these surgeries. So if a person were to have had weight loss surgery, the menu that they get, I mean, as you well know, it's liquids versus then you graduate to purees, then soft foods, then back to essentially a regular diet over time. Mm -hmm. It's all high protein, meaty stuff initially, uh, you know, with some Powerade in there, some Gatorade in there, yeah. make sure that you're getting your electrolytes and all of that. Right. But, you know, there wasn't a whole lot of fiber on yeah. that menu. How does the person who's recently had weight loss surgery tolerate these starchy, dense vegetables they that do, are high I mean, in fiber? They do, they, they do actually pretty well with it. I mean, I start in the beginning with more soluble fibers. We do a lot of beans. Uh, beans go down really well. Um, Beano if you're getting gassy, but mm. beans do pretty good job. Um, tofu is fantastic. So tofu is a great way to get protein. It goes through the pouch really easily uh, without any kind of issues. Um, the cruciferous vegetables, Brussels sprouts, cauliflower, broccoli, a little bit more difficult. Um, and so I kind of stage those in a little bit later. Mm. But in the beginning, I'm having them focus a little bit more. Uh, grains, oatmeals, things like that uh, tend to be what I focus on a little bit earlier in their diet. Are there any foods that you found like can trigger dumping syndrome? Like for me, oatmeal was a pretty random one. Oh, did High it? fiber food, but that one just triggered dumping syndrome. Yeah, it's weird. Dumping syndrome is totally random. So I, the, I, I have some patients that don't get it at all. And I got some patients that get it from one food, not another. Um, I tend to find, so oatmeal by itself shouldn't do it. It could, I usually have them add chia seeds to it mm. and the fat component and some nuts and seeds with the berries. Uh, by doing that, it kind of slows the absorption of the sugar. So you don't get it as much. Sometimes I have them add apple cider vinegar. Mm. Uh, or a shot of apple cider vinegar, which slows sugar absorption. Yeah, that was toward the earlier part of the of the post op procedure. Today, I can handle it well. Like grits yeah. to this day, I love grits, but sometimes even randomly that'll trigger it. And like we're talking like thirteen years out, and I'm still yeah. like, wow, that's that's weird. Well, actually, dumping. So there's two types of dumping. There's uh, early dumping and late dumping. So early dumping is just the cramp from food going in too quickly, the osmotic changes, that kind of stuff. But the blood sugar fluxes actually get worse when you get more and more closer to goal weight. Mm. Because you gotta think about it this way. When you were super overweight, you were very insulin resistant. Man, those pictures I saw of you before, at that time, your muscle was full of fat. And so your muscle cells were very insensitive to insulin. So your pancreas had to churn out tons of insulin for a given carb load. So your pancreas becomes like a bodybuilder, all right? The beta cell, islet cells get really big, in fact, on biopsies of the pancreas of people post gastric bypass and uh, these times where they've had to resect the pancreas show really big beta cells consistent with a disease process called nasidioblastosis where people just have too many beta cells. So you've got these strong beta cells churning out insulin just to try to push a little bit of carb into your muscle. Mm -hmm. Now you've lost all this weight and your muscle cells are super sensitive now. So now even a little bit of insulin they'll take in the carb really quickly. But your pancreas is still a monster. It could, it's still got a bunch of beta cells. So now you eat a carb and it's like, here's all this insulin like it used to give you, but now your cells are like fine and the carbs just got sucked right in. And now your blood sugar drops really, really easily. Mm. And so we see this problem with um, blood sugars even more later on than we do earlier with people that are successful. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. So, yeah. And that's something to keep in mind. I think, you know, for people who've had weight loss surgery for many years, maybe they've begun to regain, regain the weight and yeah. then they decide to adopt a plant-based diet or they're just taking the keener look at, at their nutrition. There's still, you know, funny things that go on after you've been rewired inside. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, that rewiring, you know, it, it does have an effect on hormones quite a bit. Yeah. Does the body kind of have an opportunity to adapt? Like, so you, malabsorption, you used that term mm -hmm. earlier. That's 
one of the keys to gastric bypass surgery is you, you can't absorb so much because you've literally bypassed a portion of your intestine in addition to having a smaller stomach. But over time, does that portion of your intestine that is still in use kind of adapt and learn how to absorb it a does. greater amount of nutrients? It does. Yeah. Yeah. We've seen that. Uh, and that, that possibly may be another reason that you start to get dumping syndrome even this many years out is because those cells might start to uh, basically generate more glucose receptors in the actual, uh, generally, and now we're getting really technical, generally in order to absorb the carbohydrate, you need the digestive enzymes from the pancreas mm. and the carbs to mix together. So remember you got food going down one limb, you got the digestive juices going down another limb, then they join together and then they get absorbed in the rest of the intestine. That's mm. what the gastric bypass, the ruin why, that's the why. Yeah. This rue limb, can actually start to develop glucose receptors that independently absorb glucose even without the breakdown uh, from the enzymes. And that might you know, further contribute to dumping syndrome. A lot of this is theoretical, but there is adaptation. Even in the malabsor the real malabsorption procedures like the duodenal switch, where we have very little intestine where there's absorption going on, we notice that that intestine becomes more absorptive over mm. time, and that can affect weight loss over time. I think also when it comes to malabsorption, obviously there's a lot of supplementation that needs to occur, especially early after the surgery, you know, pretty early post-op. Um, are there people that eat that more nutrient dense diet that don't require the same amount of multivitamins or oh, supplements? For sure. Yeah. I mean, I've got patients that eat really well. They don't need the same amount of vitamins. Right. I got patients eat badly, they need more. I mean, we do tend to see with a gastric bypass. So with a sleeve, we don't see a lot of vitamin deficiencies. You can get B12 deficiency. Mm. And certainly if you're on a plant-based diet, you could get B12 deficiency. So you, you ought to be taking it. Um, but with the sleeve, we don't see a lot of vitamin deficiency. With the gastric bypass, we are bypassing the duodenum. Iron absorption is through the duodenum. Menstruating females, even ones that eat well, we do see iron deficiency. Mm. Uh, we can see calcium uh, absorption deficiencies. Um, I'm pretty big about watching vitamin D levels and calcium so that we don't get bone disorders because that's the other thing we worry about. Uh, a recent study just coming out right now shows absolutely is a, a prospective um, randomized controlled trial of weight loss surgery versus medical therapy. So amazing trial. I think it's like 300 patients, uh, median of nine years. Mm. So this is a long-term follow-up. Some of them are 12 years out. And the weight loss surgery patients did excellent on everything except their bones. Mm. Uh, and that's going to be because of some of the calcium absorption issues and the vitamin D absorption and things like that. So do you recommend for the majority of your patients, regardless of the diet that they're eating, to get a yes. little calcium supplementation? Mm -hmm. That's one They of the do and, and get checked regularly. And you can't just check calcium level. So you got to check more than calcium level. You have to check a hormone called parathyroid hormone. Uh, so your parathyroid glands kind of control your calcium levels. And if your parathyroid gland is high, that means, because you could have a normal calcium level, but what did it take to get your blood at a normal calcium level? And it may be that you have a normal calcium level, like, oh man, calcium level is normal. It's normal, but your, your bone is eating itself to keep that calcium level normal. Mm. And so the parathyroid gland kind of gives you an idea if, that, if that's what's happening. So you got to make sure that not only do you get your calcium level checked, but you get your magnesium level checked, your parathyroid hormone checked, and a, a meta, uh, 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 enzyme called ALKFOS. And so these all need to be checked in order to say, oh, you're fine, you're getting enough supplement. Is there any kind of symptom somebody should be on the lookout no. for other than a broken bone? That's the first symptom. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That's a scary yeah, one. Yeah, but you could, you could go and get, you know, nuclear medicine bone scans, you know, every two, three years I would get that if I had a weight loss surgery. Let's kind of wrap this up. Let me ask you a question. One, we'll start with, what do you wish that more of your colleagues in bariatric medicine understood when it comes to the link between obesity and nutrition? Oh yeah, so much. Gosh. And I give talks to them and they kind of listen, but um, <laughs> I, I, sur surgeons are going to be a hard group to crack. It's changing. Uh, it's getting better. Um, but the idea that protein is the king and all you need to worry about is just completely wrong. I mean, these patients of theirs that are eating nothing but protein are missing so many valuable nutrients. They're missing vitamins, minerals, they're missing anthocyanins and phytochemicals and phytonutrients. And what are they missing more than anything? Fiber. And fiber, we know from multiple different studies associated with longevity and health. Um, I look at my patients that are many years out that are following my diet, not necessarily have to be vegan, but a plant-heavy diet. 
they look vibrant, right? They just look fantastic. They look healthy. Whereas I'll see other bypass patients that aren't following the diet properly. And even though they've had good weight loss, they look gaunt and sickly and not as healthy. Mm -hmm. and, and so, um, uh, they, they got to understand that the surgery is not the end all be all. The scale is not the end all be all just the number on the scale. doesn't mean someone's healthy. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's so much more to health than how much you weigh. Yeah. And my final question is, to the patients, how would you advise them here? I've always looked at, you know, when it comes to your health and weight loss and maintaining it long term, you're always on this road. And inevitably, you come to a fork. And the fork is where you can go right or you could go left. And if you choose to go back and reintroduce old foods into your mm. system that you have enjoyed and you have the fondest memories of, it probably came down through the family and you remember eating this with your mom and your dad and all of the good times, right. and just a smile on your face just by thinking about the food. Mm. How do you advise them, right, to not make that right hand turn and reintroduce those foods that would take them right back to where it is that they began and instead to make that left hand turn and to still go down that healthier path because as easy as it says, Oh, right or left, like it's right. not that easy. It's not that easy. No, it's not. It's not for me. I mean, it, you know, I still have those struggles. We all do. If you do what you've always done, you get what you always got. I think the beginning comes in recognizing and acknowledging what gets you where you are. Now there's genetic components and all that stuff, but those genetic components are driving you to eat a certain food. And you got to understand that that certain food has gotten you to where we are. Mm -hmm. And if we don't change that, if you get the surgery and you find that you're doing the same things you always did after surgery that you did before surgery, you're not going to be as successful. You're getting an opportunity to here to make a life change. And we make a big deal about this. This is your birthday. This is your new chance at a new life. And in order for it to work properly, there's an owner's manual that comes with it. And that owner's manual looks different than what you were doing before. Mm -hmm. Then there's other things that you could do. And th th that gets into above and beyond aphorisms and talk and, and motivational speeches and just do it. You got to have a game plan to help you. Um, I believe pretty strongly in cognitive behavioral therapy. Cognitive behavioral therapy is recognizing your triggers and knowing what you're going to do about those triggers before you ever get to that trigger. Mm -hmm. So that it's not like you go to your parents' house and you remember eating apple pie and now there's apple pie and you're like, oh my God, I want that apple pie. It's apple pie I used to overconsume, and it is a gateway for me to get back on the wrong track I associated it with comfort, but I could get comfort other ways. I'm going to go and hug my mom instead. And when I'm faced with this, when I go to my mom's house, you could even write it down. Instead of eating the apple pie, I'm going to eat an apple and go for a walk. And you write this down beforehand. Uh, the, there's been several studies and this works pretty well. There's a great book that I highly recommend to everybody, whether they ha had surgery or not. And it's called Beck's diet solution. And there's no diet on in there. She doesn't talk about diet. She talks about how to handle these kind of built-in cravings that uh, part of it could be physiologic and part of it could be behavioral and learned. But you have to have, first of all, a knowledge that that's in your brain and you have to preemptively come up with a solution for it. And that's what cognitive behavioral therapy yeah. is. It's important. I think wording is important. And I don't, I don't know that my, even, even my surgeon, we'll close with this, I don't even think that my surgeon realized that, you know, during the consultation, when he's explaining how the procedure works and says, well, don't worry, if you regain the weight, you can come back and we'll staple your stomach for a second it's time. It's crazy. Right? Yeah. But it's not just like, that sounds like as crazy as it is to say, well, okay, well, let's do it twice. Like, it's almost a sense of relief to people who are there for that consultation, because what that does is it says, you have now given me permission to not have to change. Right. I can go right back to where I was. This is no longer my last chance yeah. and I've still got that safety net. Yeah. So then the next question that inevitably gets asked by the patient is when can I eat this again? Yeah. And this is always, you know, pizza, burgers, cheeseburgers, fries, whatever the case may be. It's never, when can I eat an apple again? Dr. Right. Davis. Oh no. Of course it's the it's apple not. pie, man. It's, it's the apple pie. Of course yeah. it is. But I try to phrase things differently. I try to, help them see the beauty in the fruits and the vegetables and the beans. I help them try to help them see the beauty in feeling good. And, and is that apple pie worth the way you're going to feel after eating that apple pie? Or is it worth how bad you're going to feel long-term when you feel this great 
in the short term with these other foods that you're eating. And I do feel like a lot of my patients that really get it, like some patients, just a light switch goes off and they're like, oh my God, I remember that that tasted good. I remember that I needed that for this deep hole within my soul. Yeah. But now I've got that hole filled. I feel great. And that no matter how good that looks, it's not as good as I feel. And I want to stay that way. Yeah. And the people that could get that message into their brain. I mean, I was there too. You know, you could get there. People have that without. So I just eat cheeseburgers like crazy. Funny enough, in my hospital, we got free Wendy's. There's a Wendy's in my hospital. To this day. That, well, I, I don't think I got rid of it. This is another hospital where I trained at. But it was free Wendy's when I was training, <laughs> which is crazy. So I ate a lot of Wendy's. <laughs> and I loved Wendy's. It was my comfort. It oh, yeah, was my man. thing. Like when you were talking about Taco Bell, that was me. Wendy's yeah. double cheeseburger was my thing. Now, it, it, I, it's not that, because people are like, how do you do it? I, it's easy to me. I don't, I don't want that, that cheeseburger in any. It's disgusting to me. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I see that cheeseburger. I could feel sickness. I could feel how I used to feel. Mm-hmm. Uh, I could picture some you know teenage kid who doesn't care anything about that meal just splattering it on. I could go back to the cow that's in a slaughterhouse getting slaughtered for it. All of these things make me disgusted by that. But you show me a big bowl of beans and vegetables, and I want that. Yes, sir. Because I know how it makes me feel. When you can make those associations and make that change, it becomes easy. I, I agree with that. Yeah. So you know what? Let's put the pin in the conversation here. I would love to invite you back at some point to continue this because, again, complicated topic, just scratching the surface right now. But, man, I really appreciate this time. It's been great. Great conversation. Thanks. All right. Link to Proteinaholic. Yeah. His book is in the episode notes below. Definitely pick up your copy. Thank you, Dr. Garth Davis, my friend. Thanks, Chuck. If your health IQ is a couple of points higher than it was a few minutes ago, go ahead and like this video or subscribe to the YouTube channel. And to take it even higher, head over to Apple Podcast or wherever you get your favorite shows. Look for the exam room by the Physicians Committee. Hit the subscribe button there as well and help to make your world a healthier place.